You're happy today. That's great. Um, well, uh, now we're going to get into the second law of thermodynamics. Better than the first one? Yeah, each law is better than the previous. 50. <laughs> um, so the first law is a conservation law. And um, you know, we've seen it be useful in a lot of ways, but it, a conservation law can never tell you a direction that a process should happen. Uh, you know, when, when you use conservation of energy to figure out the speed of an object on a spring at this position or whatever, you input, uh, you have to know something about the location and then you can use it to calculate the, the speed. But it can't tell you which one of these things happened first, which one of these things happened second. You understand what I mean? Um, so conservation laws can never um, tell the direction of a process. Um, like what, so let me just finish this and then, so what happens first, or what happens earlier, and what happens later. Um, it's just related to the fact that all you're doing when you can, um, I guess not, because uh, same with conservation of momentum, and that's a vector quantity. Um, you, uh, all you know is that, you know that it in, this instant and this instant, these properties have to be the same, but it doesn't, it doesn't say anything. Yeah. Um, so the second law is going to, be the first way that we have to determine the direction that a process moves. And, um, There are three ways to think about the second law. Uh, so there are three equivalent forms. Of the second law. The first one is called the Clausius statement. Some guy, Clausius. Um, and this one says if heat transfers spontaneously, It always moves from a high temperature to a low temperature. This one's the most intuitive version. Um,
and you know like everybody this is part of everybody's intuition the other two are going to seem more uh sort of uh abstract uh but the other two are the ones that are going to be more most useful in calculations um The second one is called the Kelvin Planck statement. And um, that one says, and so I'm I'm gonna sort of paraphrase it here the way like I think about it, and then uh, a little later on today we'll talk about the mathematical definition, sort of a useful way to think about it mathematically. But basically, this says it's impossible to construct a heat engine, um, or let me say a power cycle. So a heat engine is based on a power cycle. Uh, your system goes through a cycle, um, and it generates power. Um, <laughs> that's right. So at the beginning and end of a cycle, the system's properties are all the same. Yep. Um, possible to construct a power cycle where all heat energy. converted to power. Um, in other words, no matter how you can construct this power cycle, there has to be some energy lost in the exhaust. Um, let me say, too, with both of these, uh, you know, even though these are sort of paraphrased, the, the wording here is important um, on both of these. So, like, for the Clausius statement, it says if you have spontaneous heat transfer. That's not saying that you can't transfer heat from a cold area to a hot area. You can do that. That's what refrigeration is. It just doesn't happen spontaneously. You have to supply work and you know there's all this stuff that has to go on to make it work and here the fact that it's a cycle is important um, because you can just take a heat reservoir a, a high temperature reservoir uh, and run a power cycle that doesn't lose any energy in the exhaust as long as the system is changing. Basically, that has the effect of like you could say, well, I'm going to call my my exhaust reservoir part of the system, and then it would work. But it's not uh, it's not a cycle. Um, well, you know, uh, there are sort of two things going on. This one is assuming no, and we'll we'll talk about the sort of thermodynamic version of friction. Uh, what I'm saying here is true even without any uh, even without any friction. Uh, so like for example, if you exclude friction from from a calculation of a cart rolling down an incline, it'll it'll never stop. you know This is saying that even excluding friction, uh, you can't have all of that uh, heat energy turn into, so, so it's two separate things. Even in this ideal sort of frictionless case, it's impossible. Um, and then the third, uh, the one that we're going to spend by far the most time on um, is entropy. Um, 
And that one says, in any process, the total entropy of the system plus the surroundings either stays constant or increases. Um, and uh, their mathematical sort of proof type ways of thinking that relate each of these to the other two, um, they're, they're equivalent, but it's definitely not obvious at first glance why they're equivalent. Um, I want to just, so uh, we'll, in the next week or something, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about entropy and doing calculations with entropy. I just want to first give sort of a um, uh, kind of layman's uh, version of uh, what entropy measures, and I want to explain kind of intuitively how this rule about increasing or constant entropy um, is equivalent to the Clausius statement, the one that's really part of our, you know, intuition about how the world works. Okay. Uh, so, what's entropy? Um, Intuitively, um, entropy is a measure of how hard it is. Turn your thermal energy into work. Um, so uh, I think it's easiest to think of this in terms of like a piston cylinder assembly. Um, okay, so how does the heat engine work? Um, you uh, so here's the cylinder. Here's the piston. Here's your system, some gas in there. Um, and um, you have a high temperature down here that uh, increases the volume of the gas. It increase well it increases the pressure in the gas which pushes the piston up and that's how this thing uh, works and if you and to make it a cycle then you have to um, you have to cool the gas back down it'll return back to its original position um, Okay, so the the idea of getting work out of um, out of a power cycle uh, requires that you have a temperature difference between your hot reservoir and your cold reservoir, 
Um, Um, so notice that uh, you could have the same amount of thermal energy. So you have this hot reservoir and this cold reservoir, okay? Uh, and and they have a certain amount of thermal energy, a certain amount of internal energy. Um, you could just as easily take up the same amount of space, let the hot and cold reservoirs mix and have a temperature somewhere in between the two of them. And you'd have the same amount of thermal energy. You haven't lost any thermal energy, but you wouldn't be able to construct a, a heat engine out of it. You wouldn't be able to do a power cycle. Uh, that power cycle only works because of the difference in those two temperatures, okay? So if you have some fixed amount of thermal energy, uh, it's most useful to for doing work if you have, uh, if you have it separated out into one uh, very high temperature reservoir and one temperature as cold as possible, absolute zero, doing nothing, you know, uh, at that, if you have that arrangement, you can suck every bit of internal energy out of the hot reservoir into the cold one and get all of that work done, okay? Um, Uh, well, you know, uh, the, the, that's not really relevant because um, that just tells you how fast you're going to be able to transfer that heat. And that doesn't, that doesn't really matter for energy, you know. Um, right. Um, okay, so... Uh, In other words, um, for the hot and cold regions, to be most useful, you want the energy separated. into one uh, very hot region that has all the internal energy let me just finish the sentence and uh, and uh, one region at absolute zero Okay, what? I guess just intuitively, it seems like if it's spread out over a larger region, that's closer to um, having uh, to just having the internal energy be this mix of two, like hot and cold. Or am I kind of thinking about it wrong? Does the ge geometry of it matter at all? Um, is it, it seems like the, the closer this points, like the more, um, the more you have the internal energy. Well, if you, uh, uh, yes. Uh, um, I, I don't think you need to think about. I don't think you need to think about that. Um, if you. If you compress it down smaller, you're adding internal energy to it. 
you are doing that. Um, but I mean, if you have a continuum of the same thing, it's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's the main problem for us, though. Mm -hmm. And you have a handful of money, and all of it goes down, and you have some level of control. No, it would take. There's a certain amount of in internal energy, I think, that's just inherent in what the shape is, but you don't have to think about that. Um, okay, so uh, if you want to be able to get to use the most uh, possible energy from these two regions uh, to do work, you want all the energy separated into one place, absolute zero in the other place, and then all the way down until you have your last uh, exchange of energy. This so now you're you have your last joule of energy in the high temperature region, and it's not very high anymore. You know now it's close to absolute zero, and you'd have your absolute zero region, and you'd still be able to construct a heat engine that that takes this higher temperature the en the energy from the higher temperature region and moves it to the colder region. Okay. Um, so here's the connection between that Clausius statement and the entropy statement. Uh, the entropy form of the second law. Um, uh, every bit of heat that goes from the high temperature region to the low temperature region <laughs> energy every bit of <laughs> that seems like that would be a good word possibly but every um every bit of heat that goes from the high temperature region to the low temperature region goes from being more useful to less useful. Can you see why that would be? So say that you have, well, say you have this one region that's a uh, thousand degrees Kelvin and you have this one region that's absolute zero, okay? and and a joule of energy transfers from the 1000 K region to the absolute zero region, okay? That joule of energy was really useful when it was in the hot area, but now that it's transferred over and now it's barely slightly increased the temperature of what was once absolute zero, okay? It's barely decreased the temperature of the hot region, but now you have this energy that's kind of locked in the low temperature region. You see why that is? Like the only way to extract that energy is to find a lower temperature region. And finding a, a region lower than, with a temperature lower than 0.0001 Kelvin or whatever is really hard, you know? So you've gone from being able to use that in a heat engine with almost anything else as the cold region to, to having to be very selective about where you can use it. And so that's kind of the, um, the intuitive, region, intuitive reason why every process that happens, every thermal process that happens, every bit of energy that goes from a high temperature region to a low temperature region uh, is making that energy hard, harder to use in the future. You know, basically like, Little by little, everything's just steadily marching towards a world where there are no temperature differences, you know. And so, like, if you've heard the um, the description of entropy is like disorder, 
it's kind of like it's disorder in the sense that um that that energy is hard to use you know it's it's more that that energy is spread out over more areas instead of having like oh i know where to find that energy it's in this one region where all of it is that's what you want you know uh if once it gets spread out it's like there's energy everywhere you know like your room <laughs> Yeah, I, that sounds, yeah, right. I, that sounds like a reasonable analogy, yeah. Um. Okay, so that, that's what's coming with entropy. And uh, the reason it's going to be useful is that uh, we're going to have equations that describe it. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to leave it at that. Uh, I'm not going to go through... Uh, the reason that the Clausius and the Kelvin Planck statements are equivalent. Um, but there is such a thing out there, you know. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is uh, reversible and irreversible processes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I guess so. Uh, is the connection is sometimes the connection between the quasi statement and the existence of the quasi, mm -hmm. and that's because it's impossible to have a cycle that doesn't that, that reduces uh, heat transfer to derive spontaneous cycle. Yeah. Okay. So so yes the. The reason, so the energy always has to go from the hot temperature to the cold temperature in a heat engine because that's the Clausius statement. And the entropy thing is every time you move energy to a cooler region, you're making that energy less useful. That's the connection. Um, so a reversible process. One where both the system and the surroundings uh, could be returned to their original state. Um, the things that make this impossible, in the case that you don't have a reversible process, are called irreversibilities. And irreversibilities, you can sort of think of as the thermodynamic version of friction. And in fact, any friction in, in your uh, machinery is one example of an irreversibility. Um, um, that's energy that's used up that can't be um, can't be re uh, captured. So, like, for example, uh, friction-wise, you know, if you uh, let a box slide down an incline, 
Um, that energy doesn't disappear. It goes into sound and, uh, and temperature change. Um, but capturing that change in temperature and capturing that, those sound waves and using them to, to help move the box back up the ramp it isn't possible. And it's the same idea with this. The energy isn't gone, but it's not usable anymore. Um, and so uh, here are the types that we're going to see. Um, so here are the irreversibilities that will come up for us. in this class. Um, the first one is heat transfer. Over a finite temperature difference. Um, so in order to have a reversible process, the heat transfer has to occur over an infinitesimal difference in temperatures. Um, in practice, you would never even try to approximate that because the closer the two temperatures are to the same, the slower the process of transferring energy takes, you know. Um, so let's say, but transferring heat over an infinitesimal temperature difference would take, you know, infinitely long. So, okay, that's not practical, but that's, uh, that's the ideal that, like, when we talk about reversible uh, power cycles and things like that, we're talking about making the assumption that all of this heat transfers over an infinitesimal temperature difference. The second type of irreversibility is um, unrestrained. Expansion of a gas. So if the gas uh, is moved from one region into a bigger region, uh, there's no pressure uh, making that making that expansion happen uh, in you know quasi equilibrium slow um, slow way. Then that's also uh, losing energy that you can't get back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's the opposite of that. Uh, so if you have a reversible, um, if it's all reversible, uh, then en entropy change is zero. And if it's, if you have irreversible, yeah, right. I, yep. That's right. Yep. That's right. Um, friction in parts. And then the last one I'll list here is uh, any resistance to electric current. So any current moving through a resistance, uh, same thing.
And then there are other ones, but those are those are the ones that are going to be important to us. Mm -hmm. No, that's fine. That's good. I don't know. I, I don't have an answer to that yet. Um, okay, so, and yeah, there's all of these are happening all the time. So, so there's no such thing as building a reversible process, okay, um, or reversible cycle, but uh, we're going to use this idea in the same way that, like, in physics, you um, you make the assumption of zero friction or uh, what other? Yeah, and so there's sort of two things. One is, like, yeah, you're hoping that you can limit irreversibilities, and the other thing is um, this gives, this is a way to calculate a theoretical limit to performances of machines, given your, you know, your what your temperatures are in your two reservoirs, um, the same way like you would say, you know, you calculate the acceleration of some of a cart rolling down an incline, saying there's no friction, and then you know that that the real thing it might be close to that. It definitely isn't going to be more than that. You know, and that's the same idea as this. We're going to get our sort of theoretical limits on the efficiency of, of these cycles. Yep. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yes. That's right. That's it. I think that that probably is exactly what it is uh, mathematically. Yeah. You. Uh, potential energy, you lose it one way, you get it back on the way back. Friction doesn't work like that, and that's the same thing as here. Yeah. Uh -huh. Right. Right. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, now I want to uh, bring up the way these cycles are going to work. So, um, we're going to be talking about, um, a power cycle. A refrigeration cycle. and a heat pump cycle. And all of them, uh, there's work involved in all of them. And there's a high temperature reservoir in all of them and a low temperature reservoir in all of them. Uh, and the temperatures of those reservoirs are going to be an important uh, thing that we're going to be dealing with as we, you know, talk about these theoretical limits of performance and stuff like that. Let me just sort of draw diagrams of how these things work. Um, so first, the power cycle. Um, so here, I'm going to call this uh, T sub H, so like the hot temperature. And here is the T sub C, the cold temperature. And then our system is in here. And the way a power cycle works is um, we have heat that goes from the hot to the cold. And the result, and actually, let me, 
let me break this up into two pieces. So let's say we have uh, heat that goes to our system. Uh, so I'm going to call that Q sub H. And then we have work that's output. That's W. And then we have the exhaust that goes from our system to the cold region. Ah, uh, no, there. Uh, I mean, I suppose you probably could do. We we're not going to treat them as vectors. I mean, I guess they're they're um, you know positive or negative. That's how we determine the direction. Um, but so with a power cycle, you have heat going from the high temperature region to the system. You use that to make to uh, generate work, and then you lose some heat in the exhaust. That's that's Q sub C. In the refrigeration cycle, um, You um, have heat come in from the cold region. You're pulling heat out of the cold region. That's how you. That's how you get the temperature of a freezer or something down. You know, below the temperature of the room. So we'll call that QC. That's coming into the system into the refrigerant. Um, how can you do that? Uh, well, we, you know, we know that can't happen spontaneously. And so uh, in order to do that, you need uh, work in order. And the way you do it is you compress it, the gas and let it expand at various times so that even though you're not, it's not changing the, um, well, I guess it is changing it. Um, but like if you, so you start with the refrigerant, you compress it a lot. Uh, it makes the temperature high. Uh, when it's at a high temperature, you bring it up to the high temperature region and drop off energy. That's this QH. And then you let it expand. Now it cools down to a temperature below what it was before because you've dropped off this energy in the high temperature region. And then, and now that it's your refrigerant is extra cold, you bring it down to the cold region, the freeze, you know, to exchange uh, energy with the freezer itself, pull more heat out of the freezer, and then keep going through that cycle. Okay, so that's the refrigeration cycle. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you, if you feel the back of a refrigerator, it's hot, and, and uh, that's what the coils in the back are doing. They're exchanging, uh, they're exchanging heat with the surroundings. Same thing with an air conditioner. You walk, you know, when you go out a door and walk behind an air conditioner and you get a blast of, of hot air. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yes. Yes. So in a power cycle, that hot temperature is like, for example, a, a boiler, something, you know, you're lighting a fire or something, you're making it really hot. Um, that goes into, imagine the gas in a piston, uh, in a, you know, in a cylinder. Um, and uh, when that temperature comes in, that gas wants to expand, and that expansion of the gas does work on the surroundings. That's right. Yep. And then uh, the last one is a heat pump cycle uh, that works pretty similar to a refrigeration cycle, just going in reverse. Um,
So there's the hot region, the cold region. Nope, this should be hot. This is cold. Here's the system. Um, and in this one, the hot region is like the inside of your house. Um, and you're trying to transfer uh, heat Q sub H into your house. Um, the um, your system is cooler than the house, so in order to do that, you need to um, do work on the gas, and uh, you're also bringing heat in from the cold region. So that's Q sub C. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could say, well, I mean, actually, so th yeah, those are the same thing because that's what, if you turn an air conditioner around and the coils are in your house, your air conditioner becomes a heat pump. Yeah, that's right. The only difference is Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the McDLT from McDonald's with the <laughs> their lowest entropy hamburger ever? With the it had it came in like a this styrofoam thing with two separate areas, and it just had the the hamburger and like one half the bun in one side, and then the lettuce and tomato and stuff on the other <laughs> side, and then you put it together, and it was like. No, but uh, that's how I think of that's how I think of entropy. Um, <laughs> they should have. They did. Um. All right. Any questions about so this idea of the um. I don't, uh, no, I don't follow. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Oh, yeah. Okay, right. Uh huh. Right. Yes. Right. So, yeah, I, I think it's likely that that's a, that's a machine that would run forever if there were no reversibilities, if that's at absolute zero. So, actually, and actually, we're going to see that uh, when you talk about these theoretical limits, um, the like, what does it take to get a perfectly efficient? Uh, so, you know, even with reversible power cycles, you can't get perfect efficiency unless your cold region is absolute zero, and then you could. Yeah. Yeah, right. That's where we're heading towards. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Right. The. Yeah, I mean, a car engine is a power cycle with the added. Yeah. Right. Yes, that's right. Yep. And the the engine is a power cycle, except it adds the extra little bit of chemical 
potential energy, you know. Um, uh, okay, so, so one more thing about reversible processes. Uh, like reversible processes. Um, you can also have um, internally reversible processes. Um, so that's uh, an internally reversible process is one where you could return your system back to the starting state, but not the, not the surroundings. Um, uh, this requires um, a quasi equilibrium process. And uh, one thing to notice is um, when we talk about uh, the hot and cold thermal reservoirs, um, we're always assuming that uh, whatever happens to those is internally reversible. So no energy is lost through things that happen inside the thermal reservoirs. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, there is, it's, it's related to the thing about, um, having irreversibilities related to, um, a rapid expansion of a gas. I, uh, you know, I, I don't really know. I mean, I would imagine that it has something to do with the sort of chaotic, uh, you know, motion of particles when they, like, when they go through a motion really fast, you know. Like, if you put a gas into a, if you put a jar of a gas into a room, you know, there's, there's energy that's lost because it's expanding so fast. Uh, that's about the best I. Uh, I can think. Mm -hmm. So thermal reservoirs are always assumed to be internally reversible. Okay, uh, so now with all this uh, background stuff done, uh, I'm going to give the mathematical version of the Kelvin Planck statement. I go back and forth between Kelvin Planck and Kelvin Planck. What do you guys say? Planck? So the Kelvin Planck statement of the second law. And it says that um, uh, 
for a system uh, undergoing a cycle um, with a single uh, um, the work done, so this is a, undergoing a cycle, this is a power cycle. Work done during that cycle is equal to, well, is less than zero. Uh, so less than zero work can be done net um, if there are internal reversibilities present. And it's equal to zero if it's internally reversible. And um, so remember what, you know, I said was sort of the intuitive version of the Kelvin-Planck statement was that you can't uh, construct a heat, a power cycle, I mean, that takes in heat and uses it all for work. You have to have a cold reservoir where some of that heat is lost through exhaust. Okay, so that's the int intuitive version. Um, yeah. Irreversibility is on the top. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so this is saying, so if you do construct try to construct a power cycle. Um, so it's a cycle, and you do only have one thermal reservoir, so you only, you're using heat from one uh, hot temperature reservoir. Um, you can't produce, you can't produce work um, if, uh, If you have an internally reversible system, so you don't have any friction type things inside your system, then you can produce zero work, you know, that's what the law says. And if you do have reversibilities, then you actually have to supply work to keep, to keep this cycle moving. Um, and we're going to use this mathematical description now as we talk about um, uh, efficiencies and performance coefficients uh, of different types of, of cycles. Okay, so first thing this shows, so I guess notice that right away this shows um, that there's no um, perfectly efficient power cycle. Um, which is the statement that I gave before of the Kelvin-Planck second law. Um, the efficiency of a power cycle is given as the Greek letter eta. It's like a scripty capital N. And it's equal to the work done by the cycle divided by the energy provided at the hot reservoir. Um, 
and you can also write this as one minus uh, the heat lost the exhaust divided by the heat gained at the boiler at the high temperature reservoir. Um, so this new form comes from the fact that uh, the energy you put in, Q sub H, is equal to the energy you put out because it's a cycle. And the energy you put out is uh, that work plus the heat lost at the cold reservoir. Um, well, yeah, so, uh, so if, so for this case of the single reservoir pH, um, Q sub C has to be equal to zero. And so you can see that um, uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, cool. So the exhaust is the heat lost to the cold reservoir. Um, so if you only have that single high temperature reservoir, then you can see Q sub C has to be equal to zero, and therefore um, this efficiency is equal to one. You can see that in the second form there. So, yeah. Single... Uh, but no, no cold reservoir. So that's that's what I'm. That's what this law is saying isn't allowed. Um, you have to lose. You have to lose energy through heat into into exhaust into. Um, so the cold reservoir is like the environment or whatever. So. Um, so for. Well, I, you need to have something that's doing work or it's not a power cycle. Um, Well, there can be a temperature difference between your system and the and the hot reservoir. So, oh, okay. And so, so heat can still come into your system, um, but if if heat isn't also being ejected into a cold reservoir, then uh, you can't have a cycle because you're just building up energy inside your system. Okay, so um. So you can see, anyways, this is sort of the connection between this mathematical form of Kelvin Planck statement and the intuitive form that I gave before. Um, so using this mathematical description, okay, uh, we know that um, cycle with with no heat lost to a cold reservoir. Um, the total uh, the total work has to be uh, you know zero or negative, and so here we're saying um, if you don't have a cold reservoir, this efficiency would have to be equal to one, but that's not possible because uh, that would mean that the work done by that cycle over the heat gained from the hot reservoir. Uh, you know that they're equal, and and that's impossible. Um, that's impossible because the, uh, is, 
I guess maybe a, a recent with the Alliance of Boston system is that a lower income person or is uh, a QA that is going to necessarily imply that there uh, is a temperature difference between another um, between something adjacent to the system. Um. Uh, I mean, I guess, mm -hmm. I, I guess that, or another way of saying that is that it's impossible for, um, like, if you, uh, if you had the system at a lower temperature than mm -hmm. the hot reservoir, yeah. that's logically equivalent to having, like, a smaller system that's attached to the reservoir. Yeah, that's true, but the thing is, so the, the cycle is the key thing there. You know, it has, <clears throat> we have to be talking about a cycle, which says that the state of the system can't be changing each time around. And so, so you, could, you could put a cold reservoir inside your system and then just be ejecting heat to this cold reservoir that's inside your system. But then it's not a cycle because you're, you're changing the internal energy of, your, of, your, of the gas of the system. Uh, okay. Uh, any other questions? Let's stop there. Uh, I'm almost done with this setup stuff, and then uh, we can get into talking about the entropy form and do some problems and stuff.